Good morning. I'm Nathaniel Osgood, and I want to begin by saying what an honor and privilege it is to be here today. It's a difficult thing giving this talk in the wake of the, uh, the unimaginable tragedy um, late Friday. But in many ways, it's, it's fitting, because uh, this talk uh, is motivated by the desire to, um, to help head off, um, help greatly lessen the burden of another tragedy in Saskatchewan, um, one of Saskatchewan's uh, growing opioid crisis. And I'm specifically going to be um, speaking about um, why I believe a, an investment in predictive analytics uh, could help us uh, very effectively uh, lower that burden um, by allowing for more judicious uh, policy choice, um, by helping us uh, more quickly and more reliably understand just what's happening out there so that we can respond to it with greater uh, effectiveness and so that we can marshal our limited resources to greatest effect. Just by way of background, um, uh, I serve as a professor in the Department of Computer Science at University of Saskatchewan. Um, but uh, for uh, about 30 years now, since uh, just between my undergrad and, and, and graduate time at MIT, um, I've been um, using predictive analytics to help address issues uh, of, of societal importance with uh, the past 20 of those years having been focused on uh, applications within the health sphere, leveraging uh, predictive analytics, uh, uh, system science, uh, as a particular sort of uh, context for that, um, uh, data science, computational science. And our work has spanned a wide variety of areas with partners uh, worldwide. Uh, in recent years, uh, our work has um, particularly uh, started to, uh, to intersect um, with other spheres in a cross-sectoral fashion, particularly with, uh, with issues at the, uh, the intersection of, of health and social services and justice. Um, an example of this that um, uh, directly uh, speaks to the opioid um, context has to do with their work um, partnering with um, uh, highly trained service dogs, trained by uh, Adiamas, the service dog, uh, uh, whose, whose members are responsible as well for service dog training for our RCMP. Um, and uh, use of those service dogs to help um, support and, and catalyze positive change among opioid dependent veterans with uh, post-traumatic stress disorders. This deals with a somewhat different aspect of our work, although modeling is involved, predictive analytics. Um, it, at this juncture, it's, it's, it's very much um, uh, drawing on uh, wearable devices, uh, smartphone apps coming uh, out of our lab here in, in Saskatchewan um, and looking at, at, indic at outcomes indicators uh, for the veterans um, and how the presence of a service dog and the closeness of that presence catalyzes uh, a change and, and lowering a burden associated with things like flashbacks, improves social contact and isolation and provides emotional support and, and, uh, and enhanced uh, physical activity, et cetera. Now, within today's talk, um, uh, given the, the governmental context, uh, I want to uh, emphasize that a great deal of this work has taken place, uh, particularly in recent years, with a wide variety of government partners. Um, those include others uh, here in the province, the Saskatchewan Ministry of Health, Health Quality Council, um, uh, and, and I, as I noted more recently, very close contact with uh, close uh, collaborative relationship with uh, social services, uh, with Ministry of Justice, um, and, and in fact with the uh, Saskatoon Police Service uh, through the Predictive Analytics Lab. Now our work within, um, uh, within Saskatchewan um, uh, has focused on those ministries. We've also worked a great deal with uh, health regions over the years. Um, and more recently with the Health Authority. Um, 
Uh, beyond that, we've worked with other provinces, most notably uh, with Alberta Ministry of Health and, and Alberta Health Services for larger scale health surveillance, uh, but also with uh, the federal government in the form of uh, Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, in uh, the U.S., um, our work has involved U.S. National Institutes of Health um, uh, as a collaborator, but also uh, LA Department of, of Public Health through our collaborations with UCLA. Um, and finally, uh, we have uh, quite a lot of work going on in the Australian context, particularly with the Australian Capital Territories with gestational type 2 diabetes. Also some work uh, linked with uh, New South Wales Health on, on uh, suicide prevention. And for anyone who's interested in, in, in having uh, points of reference, case studies of how predictive analytics in the form of modeling um, has, has really um, uh, contributed greatly to other contexts, I, I would uh, refer you to uh, my colleague Grant Fast with the Ministry of Health uh, uh, modeling work that we've done in the ED weights and patient flow and more recently in the connected care strategy. Um, I'll talk more about that in a moment, um, but also with Brian Rector with the, uh, the REBI branch of uh, social services and justice with whom we have a, a very tight growing um, connection that, that crosses uh, several areas. He can also speak about the connections with um, uh, the Saskatoon Police Service. Now, it's useful to have as a reference, have a, a sort of case of, of point, point um, the, uh, the ED weights and connected care work we've been doing for the Ministry of Health. Ministry of Health came to us um, a little bit over uh, three years ago um, aware of the fact that, um, well, well, the long waits in the ED seem like a um, an issue of, of ED functioning. Uh, in fact, they're a reflection of a very tangled, coupled system. Um, their roots lie not just in the emergency room, but also in issues um, having to do with the management of acute care wards, and certainly their, their capacity, but also uh, processes for managing them, for example, uh, discharge planning. They have to do with um, uh, with factors as well out in the community, um, uh, with uh, inadequate home care services. People present for care in ways that um, that could otherwise be dealt with by um, uh, by by uh, standard uh, general practitioners or primary care physicians. Um, uh, just as critically, um, uh, someone might not uh, be able to be discharged from the hospital because lack of available home care, or because there's not a long-term care facility uh, located near their hometown, which is the, um, the nexus of their social support network, which is critical for their effective uh, recovery and, and, and functioning to help prevent them from having to come in yet again to the, uh, to the ER. Um, but it also has to do with service delivery, whether it's uh, oxygen, BiPAP and CPAP services, um, transportation, uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy um, uh, that are needed out there in the community um, in order that have to be aligned for, in order for them to be discharged. And so while we're dealing with an issue that at a certain face level seems to be an issue having to do with the ED, in fact, it's, it's indicative of a, of a systemic uh, dysfunction, a situation where the issue is not in any one piece of the system being out of whack, but rather their coordination and their balancing. Um, it's, it's a system which is out of balance and discoordinated. And uh, I would argue the situation is very much like this with opioids. Um, what may seem on the face of it to be, you know, a simple uh, medical problem associated with overdoses, if you look at it as its roots, at its drivers, um, it's systemic in nature. Its roots lie in many, many different areas. Um, its, its roots lie in, in different entry routes. Uh, uh, people uh, prescribed uh, uh, opioids through chronic pain management, but also for post-operatively. Um, uh, novelty seeking um, individuals uh, sometimes make use of, 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 of opioids and, 
uh, OxyContin. Um, in earlier days, these days, uh, potentially even much more dangerous drugs like fentanyl, and others seek it uh, to escape uh, dysphoria. There's issues, of course, in the justice and policing side with, with dealer networks, um, but more broadly with the social embedding of opioid abuse and, and pain management. Um, individuals' uh, ability to manage their pain effectively is shaped very much through their social networks and their likelihood of abusing and likely of initiating treatment and, and staying clean is very much a reflection of, of who's around them and who's, who's influencing them, who's offering them substances, or who's supporting them. Um, the U.S. Surgeon General just recently uh, advised broad carrying of, of naloxone kits, um, and, and certainly that's, a, um, that's an area of, of significance here. Um, but also we know a delivery uh, of naloxone by police is, is an important uh, important issue and, and risk of police exposure and need to remove dealers. Um, we, we recognize that social disruption um, is not only a, a, a tragic effect of, of opioid use with families uh, torn apart who can't care for their children properly or, um, or, or loved ones who uh, uh, who's uh, falling into to opioid dependence, um, uh, deprives the family of, of, of means of, uh, of earning a living. But um, we also recognize that social disruption is a cause of opioid uh, disruption, particularly for individuals who seem predisposed to, to opioid use um, coming from dysphoric backgrounds, coming from backgrounds of, of uh, personal exposure to trauma or substance use in their parents, uh, seeking, um, um, seeking use of opioids as, as an escape mechanism. Uh, we know this issue is, uh, also crosses into issues of corrections and, and the limited options available for, uh, for institutional detox um, uh, with, uh, with individuals, for example, in remand, the potential for expanding that um, for example, within um, uh, corrections facilities. We know also that if the opioids interact in complex ways with, uh, w with drug policy and, and other drugs, illegal drugs, in broad ways. This includes, uh, uh, most notably, cannabis, where the, um, the legal status is changing rapidly. Um, where, where we recognize that cannabis provides a, a gateway to drug use for, for many individuals, but also provides an alternative to opioids um, for pain management, and also a means of, of effectively managing withdrawal symptoms um, in a way that, uh, that, that poses uh, potential benefits um, in terms of, of managing um, opioid dependence and in growing free of it. And we recognize that in today's uh, rapidly changed IT uh, uh, context, uh, the, uh, the internet is serving as an effective conduit for exposure to, um, to opioids. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, IT is, uh, is, is critically of interest in terms of gaps in the provincial uh, uh, information systems for pharmaceutical uh, management and the lack of, of, of analysis that's been conducted. And of course, uh, overhanging all of this is, is a broad set of, of uncertainty. And this uncertainty is most keenly felt given the nature of the complexity, the fact that these factors are tangled together or, or uh, exhibit this sort of coupling um, that makes intervention in one area have effects throughout the system. Um, you know, change of prescribing policy ends up affecting police calls associated with uh, uh, with with opioid um, um, uh, overdose response, um, and ends up affecting what's happening at corrections. There's a very key need: where do we invest resources for action? To what degree, you know, should we be focused on integrated creating an integrated pain clinic here in the province? Um, to what uh, Degree should we instead put our efforts into tamper-proof dispenser designs for for uh, for pills, uh, or expanded treatment options and corrections, or um, added police training for seizures in the context of of of, uh, of uh, potentially liquid um, liquid narcotics. Um, 
should we look into harm reduction um, efforts or, or move towards recovery-oriented systems of care proposed by some prominent commentators in the literature? And really, this is a, a quandary that affects us with many complex systems. We don't know quite what's going on out there in the system and how to interpret the data that's coming in, but critically, we don't know where to invest resources most effectively for action. And um, we're aware of the fact that uh, a misstep in one area, say in the cannabis uh, area, um, could lead to blowback effects that, that we don't understand um, in terms of their impact. We're dealing in short here with, with uh, different silos of the government, justice on the one hand, health um, and social services that are each familiar with different parts of a whole elephant. But the elephant as a whole is something very different than the sum of its parts. And we need to deal with the whole elephant to, to have effective policies for capturing that elephant. Now, for many years, uh, in the form of, um, of dynamic models, we've been practicing um, uh, pr predictive analytics as applied to societal issues. Uh, these dynamic models um, uh, represent uh, and capture in an operational way, in a way that's, that's runnable, that you can run and see the effects, uh, hypotheses concerning the interaction of a wide variety of factors out there in the population. In other words, we capture in the model some, some theory as to what might be going on out there so that we can understand if, if that theory is consistent with the evidence and its implications over time when we run uh, the model, when we simulate the model. Um, so these models provide us this way of, of more quickly spotting inconsistencies between our thinking uh, and in what's in fact uh, playing out in the world. And once we develop some confidence in a hypothesis by, by testing it against available evidence, they provide a way to examine the diverse system-wide consequences of changes in one or more areas of the system. So we could say, you know, if fentanyl were to come into the province um, uh, in a big way uh, in the urban centers, what are its likely implications and what policies are most likely Feel greatest effect. If we were to change um, a prescribing policy in such and such a way, what would its uh, impact be? If we could uh, shut down dealer networks more effectively in rural areas, how might that affect things? And these models broadly help us to understand um, uh, system vulnerabilities, uh, leverage points for, for intervening in the system, and ways of, of changing the system structure and coordinating those across different areas. Now, we don't have time to go into the, to the underlying um, ways in which these models are constructed or, or the theory behind them. But many of the models are, are geographically rooted. They involve uh, placement in a spatial environment, uh, particular actors called agents uh, who circulate, engage in behavior, make decisions, visit doctors, for example, um, are, are prescribed uh, medication. Um, uh, take uh, take those medications, undergo uh, different strategies for uh, for pain management. Some become addicted um, and transition to a dealer-based network, etc. And we've built these models for a wide variety of partners, um, uh, many of whom I, li I listed earlier. This is a model from uh, Sydney. This is a model from Saskatoon involving foodborne illness. This is a model uh, together with our Los Angeles partners. Um, involving the, the Women, Infants, and Children program um, um, that, that receives broad uh, government support within the, uh, the U.S. Um, what's notable is that these models not only have interfaces, which are very visual, which can be shown to indiv individuals to motivate, um, um, to motivate uh, community discussion and, and, and discussion of trade-offs of policies, um, but there are, the assumptions behind them, if the models are built well, the assumptions behind them, the broad features of those assumptions are often quite transparent. And we can sit down with stakeholders and, and discuss our implications, or discuss our assumptions behind the model, and they can critique it. They can help us advance our understanding, fill in the gaps, help, help elicit tacit knowledge on their part, um, that can be brought to the table to, to further refine our understanding and it's the way in which we capture it in the model. Um, these models uh, are often built um, and are best built 
and large cross-disciplinary teams. Now, there's many misunderstandings uh, concerning models uh, out there, um, and one of the most uh, one of the most pervasive and one's per most pernicious has to do with this conception of these models as crystal balls, crystal balls that tell us what to do and, and that they attempt to offer perfect predictions. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, this is very far from the truth. Um, uh, the fact is that these models uh, do not tell us what to do. They're one more source of, of evidence, one more source of, of reasoning um, that's added to a, a broad discussion. Um, but, but more importantly yet, um, or equally important yet, um, they're not crystal balls, but they serve instead as, as, as tools for more effective learning. They represent uh, learning prostheses, learning, uh, learning tools that help us learn more quickly, robustly, and quickly. Um, and, and I say this word prosthesis advisedly um, here. Um, a prosthesis uh, is, is a device that allows us, uh, a device or system that allows us to, to overcome uh, our limitations so we can achieve full function or nearly full function in certain areas. Um, they help compensate for our weaknesses. And we as humans have a remarkable um, uh, set of, of mental facilities. Um, and in some areas, such as pattern recognition, it's exceptional. An area where it really, really falls short and where this has been rigorously documented is in reasoning through the behavior uh, and, and, and impacts of, of trying to manage these complex systems, these systems that are tangled and gnarly, these systems that are, uh, that are coupled. Simulation models um, uh, step into here by providing us with this way of, of, of doing something that computers do, which is lots of dumb operations. Specifically, a model allows us to capture in an, in an operational way, in a way that's, that's runnable, our assumptions in a way that's very precise. Um, and by doing this, they can help us learn more quickly by having us uh, see what the implications are over time of those assumptions in a way that we just can't mentally. And they allow us to do this um, much more consistently, reliably, rigorously, much more quickly and thoroughly than we could in our head. And as a result, they allow us to put whatever empirical evidence uh, we do have to more effective and complete use. By, by understanding more quickly if it's consistent with our thinking about this system and thereby more quickly spotting inconsistencies in our thinking and correcting our thinking, um, but also informing our choices, uh, informing our choice of, of which policy is likely to have um, uh, the best effect. Most critically, it also takes our understanding and, and disagreements out of our heads and puts them in the clear light of day where we can collectively critique them, uh, refine them, and advance them rather than arguing about sort of vague um, understanding in our head we can put it out in a way that will allow it to be advanced in a, in a rigorous fashion so models like this um, far from being things we build in a back closet are 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 actually uh, built um, best in a context where we're constantly observing from the world correcting our assumptions in those models observing the consequences of our actions in the world and refining our mental model as a result and refining our mental model by, by um, interaction with the model over time in terms of its behavior. Because models like this often capture the fact that, that the systems that they characterize out there in the world have very unexpected effects, unexpected effects with respect to, um, to actions undertaken in those systems, unexpected in terms of the implications of uh, of external factors. Now these models play um, many different roles and as, as part of the predictive analytics area they can serve in, as what-if tools to identify desirable policies, policies that are high leverage, that are robust and cost-effective, robust given our uncertainties. They can help us evaluate the effects of, of restructuring the system uh, to understand trends and make sense of interaction of, of diverse information and processes. They can also help us prioritize research and data collection in identifying inconsistencies in our thinking, spot inconsistencies in data, and help us point to data that's particularly valuable, and help us learn from contexts where 
solutions have been uh, effective to translate those effects into our context. It's critical to note these models are not silver bullets. They're tools that help, effect, uh, help us effectively complement our existing toolbox um, within the um, within the area of, of opioid management, within the area of, of health policy and, and drug policy. I've noted they're not crystal balls. They're not built entirely by model, by modeling teams that are cross-disciplinary in nature, where, and they're best built where many members of a team can look at that model. It's transparent enough that they can critique it, understand it, provide feedback. We can elicit from them tacit knowledge regarding different areas of a system. They're not black boxes for decision-making. They should be transparent. They're not dependent upon complete data. Some of the most valuable times we use them as, it, as we'll see is, is when there's uncertainty. They're not alternatives to data. They're ways of taking that data, that evidence, and putting it to greatest use by, by allowing us to spot more quickly whether that evidence is consistent with our thinking and what the implications of that evidence for decision-making. They're not replacements for traditional analysis, um, rather they complement it. And they're not one-shot uh, one attempts to find solutions which are thrown off by other events. As we'll see, particularly with uh, machine learning techniques like particle filtering and particle MCMC, we can keep these models current to the very latest evidence. And we, we typically have update these models um, in a team-based environment with uh, added understanding. Finally, they're not attempts at perfect representation of real world systems. Now we're, we're faced very much in the opioid area as is routine for models with big uncertainties. And indeed, this is much of the motivation for using models is when the uncertainties are very large. We can use these models to conduct uh, contingency planning under different possible scenarios how might we management, uh, manage these things? We might find certain common needs, common ground uh, for across those policies we've got to invest in as a priority immediately, it's clear. In other cases, we might put in place rules for when we'd switch from one policy to another based on um, uh, arriving evidence. Uh, I noted in the context of uncertainty, we want to use the model as a learning tool, uh, eliciting credit. Um, critiques from, from across the team and periodically from broader stakeholders, patients with lived experience of opioid addiction, for example. We conduct sensitivity analysis to understand the degree to which these uncertainties that we observe um, uh, really affect uh, the model recommendations. Um, and we draw on diverse sets of evidence that collectively might allow us to triangulate the underlying situation, even if any one piece of evidence is uncertain. And finally, we make use of machine learning techniques to automatically update the model when new data uh, becomes available. Um, we often are in a situation of, of great ongoing unfolding uncertainty, and we don't want the model to, to operate blind. Instead, using machine learning techniques, um, and we here at, in our group at uh, University of Saskatchewan are, are one of the worldwide leaders in taking these sort of models and, and developing techniques based on machine learning. Uh, I mentioned names earlier, particle filtering, particle MCMC, automatically regrounding these uh, models with the latest evidence. So at any one time, they, they, they build in the latest evidence, they're current, they're fresh, and, and capture the current situation well, and they can be used to look forward with great confidence. Even if they would eventually go off because of stochastics, uncertainties, um, used unaided, together with that regrounding, they are kept um, uh, very, very accurate. In addition, this sort of process gives us a sort of three-dimensional picture of what's going on in the system. It helps us estimate throughout a system what's happening in a way that allows us to, to anticipate what's coming up um, and have a good sense of what's currently going on in the system. So in the opioid area, um, our anticipated work would involve um, a set of basic model inputs um, that will be drawn on a cross-sectoral basis. Uh, this includes prescriptions uh, 
from, from PIP, ED presentations associated with opioids. Yes, things like arrests of dealers um, and uh, incarcerations, um, occurrence of opioid overdoses and deaths from those, um, um, naloxone treatment deliveries, um, and arrests or complaints um, uh, involving, involving users. But there's also very large um, uh, sets of big data, um, um, some of which we, we have extensive collections on uh, related to, uh, to opioids. These include records from, from PIP, um, these, uh, this electronic uh, province-wide uh, information system, um, uh, and, and things such as 911 calls and, and police databases. Um, it includes lab test results and point of sale records, but it also could um, um, very much strongly draw on things such as uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter feeds and Twitter chatter, um, uh, police databases, administrative data for treatment services conferred, uh, point of sale, uh, point of sale data for uh, naloxone kits. Um, and even in Sentinel groups, things uh, that, that would leverage our, uh, our wearables and, and, and smartphone-based uh, based platform, and even things such as keyword search volume, as we'll see. Uh, this data is, is, um, is um, significant, not only because it's high volume, but also because it's high velocity. Um, it comes in very frequently. It's high variety. It has a variety of, of different components, and it's high veracity. Collectively, it gives us a clear picture of what's going on, and it exists at a wide variety of different details. Uh, even even something as basic on, on, on this this crude end of the spectrum, um, something as basic as web searches can show sobering patterns. This pattern associated with searches for naloxone, for example, on a cross Canada uh, basis. What I'd like to emphasize here is Saskatchewan has the potential here for not only being competitive, for, but for truly leading in this area for a number of reasons. And a number of reasons that are, that are not shared by um, the vast majority of other locales. Um, number one, we have uh, the capacity using these models um, and a wide set of trained individuals trained in terms of capturing um, um, understanding involving opioids uh, in the form of dynamic models. It's a worldwide center here. We do training events every year that distinguish us as, as I believe, the foremost worldwide center for, for training involving um, uh, applications of dynamic modeling to health, and particularly uh, the, the, the cutting edge uh, agent-based modeling form. We, um, we have the, uh, the potential for very robust conclusions by bringing together machine learning and big data in, in for these predictive analytics. Um, we have uh, the potential for a, uh, a very rich, a very powerful, um, a formidable set of linked evidence from across multiple domains because of the interest in cross-sectoral collaborations here from social services, justice, uh, and corrections, and, and from police, and from um, health. Um, we have a tremendous, uh, a tremendous amount of local talent because of our training at University of Saskatchewan. My lab's about 15 people, and uh, the majority of them are highly trained in this sort of modeling. Um, and uh, we have in the form of the Saskatchewan Police Analytics Lab, which uh, we've been responsible for, for uh, designing, architecting, and rolling out um, in an extremely secure environment with multiple levels of physical and cyber security, including uh, highly rigorous uh, encryption, um, uh, a secure infrastructure for conducting predictive analytics on a cross-sectoral basis. We also have um, we also have this uh, real economy of scale where much infrastructure, trainees, modeling mechanisms, related models have been built here. We can get into this work with much less effort than would be required in many other jurisdictions and, and show results on a uh, quite uh, quick basis. Uh, we have the potential for building an ongoing asset, an ongoing um, 
point of, of, of great value for the province. Uh, so the model stays current and stays uh, current with the latest evidence. A model like this could be used to evaluate interventions and policies, clarify hypotheses about the underlying drivers, prioritize data collection efforts, um, identify key gaps in our thinking, uh, the capacity to, to make sense of, of evidence and data, um, to reach out to communities in its very visual form, and to test out potential intervention studies long before they get into the world. In terms of benefits for policing and justice uh, specifically, more judicious policy selection is probably foremost there. Um, enhancing uh, policing uh, and justice efficiency and resource use and lower need for enforcement action. Help prioritize data collection efforts. Where to, to put our efforts to, to getting additional data? Where do we really need to push? Um, and the capacity to get a more coherent picture from, uh, from evidence. It's a tool to educate the public, communities, and stakeholders as to why we're undertaking certain policies and a way of, of reducing risk to, uh, to, to officers um, by putting in, place, um, um, putting in place programs which are, are well-designed and, and well-needed and well-resourced. And it's a fast, minimal, risky way to test possible intervention studies. In terms of societal gains, many of them at the public health level, fewer overdoses, fewer individuals uh, who, who suffer from the, the uh, extraordinary uh, challenges associated with opioid disorder, uh, fewer families torn apart, torn, torn apart uh, by uh, opioid use. Um, we can concentrate, uh, this importantly, uh, lowers the opportunity cost here greatly. We can free up resources for conditions that most require it, that desperately need it. We, we can invest that money in areas where it's needed uh, very, very keenly. And it allows for greater efficiency and delivery of, of ED care and reduced, absent, reduced absenteeism that can help across the province. There are risks to the strategy of investment. Um, one is the risk of slow approval of, of data requests. Another is, is, is difficulty in addressing ethics concerns. Um, uh, this data would be used and the models would be used first and foremost for uh, operational strategic decision making and, and operation. And as such, they wouldn't be for research use. But we'd still have to pay, uh, go through presumably the data access review committee, the dark committee, and uh, and down the road, we might engage with some provincial ethics boards um, for potential resource use. And we'd want to we'd want to have plans for for navigating those, particularly the dark committee. Um, there's no question that's a slow pace of, of the academy of, and, and government. And we don't have the luxury of waiting. Um, the opioid crisis is waiting for for no one. Um, uh, and I want to highlight there's a real financial and opportunity cost for failing to seize the moment here. Um, not only is it going to take money, uh, more money, if we wait to do this later, um, that money will be taken away um, from, um, from, from other investments that could have yielded much greater benefit. Um, and there is, of course, always the challenges with uh, appropriating money. Um, and I recognize that that's hard, but I'd, I'd ask, do we have the money not to do this? Um, we may be in a situation where we're too busy bailing to plug the hole uh, if we don't do this. Um, um, we, we're so busy dealing with the consequences and pouring money into efforts to clean up after the fact that we're not dealing with the real cause for the problem. And I'd like to quote Winston Churchill here. Uh, Gentlemen, we've run out of money. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we need to think. Um, so if we don't have money to do it right, as Jeff McDonald says, why do we always think we have time and money to do it wrong? What would be required here? Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, I see two uh, potential avenues uh, towards investment. Um, one avenue uh, would involve um, a highly aggressive investment uh, with two to three staff uh, under me, my supervision, or four to five graduate students, um, the latter working um, on top of their graduate, uh, with this as their graduate research. We need um, guarantees of, of timely data availability. 
an authorization to use, and any ethics uh, permissions. Um, also, uh, we need admin support and uh, access to, uh, to key people uh, to learn from. And uh, I would need to be seconded because of, um, I, I would have a preference not to spend my, my sabbatical entirely uh, doing uh, this work. Um, the second um, option is an exploratory investment support for an initial foray of model that would last through the summer where we showcase our model um, in, um, and, and, and then use that um, to see if it's worthwhile, uh, to worth on the part of the government to, uh, to catalyze a much larger investment. We would need support through the end of the summer for several students working on this, but it would be a short-term investment um, where the government could gain confidence um, uh, in what's needed uh, um, to, and, and what, what the benefits are likely to be in a very concrete, visual way uh, before a larger investment. A couple key take-home messages. Deming dynamic models, this form of predictive analytics, uh, capture collective uh, hypotheses concerning a system and concerning the factors driving observed behavior in a system. Um, models are, are tools, are predictive analytic tools for, for ongoing learning that can help us uh, aid the speed, depth, and reliability of learning from evidence. And good models, ladies and gentlemen, are built by cross-disciplinary teams, just like good models are used for learning rather than as a crystal ball. Um, models uh, do not tell us what decisions to make, but they provide a formidable source of additional evidence and reasoning that can help us make better and more judicious decisions. These sort of models, when coupled with machine learning and, and, on, and incoming data, can help us leverage the data science revolution. Um, and I would argue that the opioid crisis um, shows all the hallmarks of a complex system, these tangled, gnarly systems, and as such can benefit strongly from predictive analytics in the form of this modeling, and particularly a form of modeling uh, that is a constant learning vehicle and that it makes use of these constantly updated models. And I would argue that for Saskatchewan, as well as other jurisdictions, an investment in, in dynamic modeling in this area with the right partners, the right model, and its coupling with, with machine learning and other aspects of, of predictive analytics and big data uh, investment in this area, in the opioid area, whether big or small, could yield, ladies and gentlemen, big returns. So I'd like to uh, provide my most sincere uh, uh, thanks and acknowledgement for those who helped make me uh, help I'll make it possible for me to be here, for Kate, uh, for Kate and those uh, organizing um, uh, this meeting. I'd like to provide further thanks to Dr. Peter Budd. Um, for, uh, for absolutely uh, seminal uh, understanding building on my part, which is still ongoing, and for, for patient uh, uh, tutoring me in, in many aspects of the, uh, the uh, opioid crisis, to Julia Barham at, at Saskatoon College of, uh, excuse me, Saskatchewan College of, of Physicians and Surgeons, Andrew Page at Western Sydney University, and Joanne Atkinson, and Jeff McDonald at Sachs, each of whom have contributed to to my understanding of, of uh, this area, and to Ron Wall, um, and Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, for uh, for his uh, very helpful discussions on uh, on on issues having to do with uh, opioid uh, dependencies and uh, substance use. Thank you very much, and I'd be uh, be glad to answer questions. It's an honor to have been here.